Our Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We pray that your spirit will be mightily present and will touch every heart and impart the virtues of Christ in the life and heart and ministry of everyone. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we're coming to James chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Verse 9, but if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin. If ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. In verse 10, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Verse 11, For he that says, do not commit adultery. Said also, do not kill now. If thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Verse 12, so speak ye, and so do you, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Verse 13, it says, For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. Tonight, as we come to this passage, the Lord is reminding us that we need to live by the royal law of liberty. The topic tonight is living by the royal law in the Lord. Come back to verse 1. In verse 1 it says, my brethren. It was talking to brethren, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Who are brethren? Who are brothers and sisters in the Lord? Those who belong to the Lord and to the Lord's family. They do not belong to Satan. They will not be brethren. They do not belong to this world. He said, I chose you out of the world. If they were still of the world, they will not be brethren. They do not belong to themselves. If they were self-centered and self-willed and self-focused and looking for self and dealing with self and ministering to self every time, they will not be brethren. They are the people who have repented. They have repented thoroughly. They have repented completely. They have repented from all sins of their past life, having let the sins of the past, and having let all the evil common sins and the peculiar sin and the evil of their lives, did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and now they are sons and daughters of God. That's what God said. Come ye from out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord. Those are the brethren. My brethren, the brethren of the apostles, the brethren of the people of God, the people that believe the same Lord, they follow the same Lord, and they obey the same word of God. Those are the brethren. And you must check up 
Are you a brother? Are you a sister? Have you repented? Repented from your past? Have you repented from everything you have been used to? Living in sin? You'll not be a brother. You'll not be a sister. Living in all the evil and the transgressions of the world, you will not be one of the brethren. But it says, if you have repented, if you have believed on the Lord, if you have become a new creature in Christ, you are saved. Those are brethren. Maybe you've gone forward beyond salvation. You're sanctified. You're purified. Your heart is purged and your life is renewed. You are a brother. Maybe you've gone beyond salvation, sanctification. You're filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in the Holy Ghost, energized, empowered by the Holy Ghost, by the virtue of the fact that the Spirit of God remains in you, abides in you, and leads you and controls you in everything you do, private, public, at home, in church, everywhere. You become part of the family of God, my brethren. Have not the faith of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. You have the nature of the Lord. You have the character of the Lord. And as he was impartial, you become impartial as well. As he was faithful to the word, he was righteous. So you become righteous, and so you do not have uh, the respect of persons of partiality. And you're dependable, you're trustworthy and your life is straightforward no hypocrisy there's no dishonesty there's no disobedience there's no private public sin nothing now you have the faith of the Lord and you hold that faith with all your heart and with all sincerity you are following the Lord of glory you are living according to the standard of the Word of God don't have the faith of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons, living by the royal law in the Lord. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the righteous Lord of laws with redemptive precepts. Number two, we're looking at the royal law of love for the royal priesthood. And then number three is the renewed law of liberty for all regenerated people. We're coming to number one. Number one is the righteous Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords with redemptive precepts. Look at that James chapter 2 again, verse 1. It says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Three things we we'll look at in this point. Number one, number one, the impartiality of Christ in his teaching. Number two, the invariability of Christ as the teacher. Number three, the inflexibility of Christ even in tough times. Tough times will come for everyone. It came to Christ. He had no sin yet. He had suffering. He had no sin yet. Temptation came. He had no sin yet. Troublous times. Tough times came. So, after we are saved, children of God, we are not going to go to heaven on a bed of roses. Difficulties might come, challenges might come, tough times might come, and times of temptation trial, even local tribulation might come. But he wants us to understand that as Christ was inflexible, an impartial, invariable at the time of his own tough trials, which you have been the grace of God saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost in those tough times where he made like Christ 
inflexible. Look at number one. Number one is the impartiality of Christ in his teaching. The impartiality of Christ in his teaching to the young, to the old, impartial. To the religious, to the irreligious, impartial. To those who are rulers among the people of the nation and to those who are peasants, ordinary people, impartial. He taught the same thing. Look at John chapter 3. We're looking at verse 1. John chapter 3 verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. What did he teach him? What did he tell him? Look at verse 2. In verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, Master, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. It's wonderful to look at the life of Jesus, righteous, cool-headed, not blown away by flattery. We know you. You're a teacher come from God, from heaven. And for a Pharisee to say that, and for a ruler among the Pharisees to say that, that was something that all the Pharisees were against Christ and all the Sanhedrin against Christ and here comes one of them here comes one of their leaders and he said we know that flattery can blow some people away that they forget to tell the truth to teach the truth to instruct in the way of righteousness look at verse 3 in verse 3 Jesus now answered and said unto him verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god that impartiality is what we need today on the pulpit and in counseling anywhere we find ourselves we have to instruct we have to teach we have to counsel we have to preach, we have to evangelize, be uniform in the word that we're given, that except a man be born again, whoever the man may be, might be a ruler among the Jews, whoever, he must be born again before he can see the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. In Matthew chapter 5, Verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, they went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciple came unto him. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, for I say unto you, he was preaching to the multitude. He was talking to the people that have, you know, various status and position in society. And yet, all of them, without exception, he said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. As he said to them at that time, he said to us, is saying to you, is saying to me, is saying to the preacher, is saying to those, you know, at the pew that accept our righteousness individually shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. We shall in no way, in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, he was talking to his own disciples here. They had been arguing and wondering who will be the greatest among us. Like many people wonder today, I mean, this section of the church, I mean, that section of the work, which one is greater? Which one is more important? I am a leader, I'm a follower, I'm a member, I'm a minister. 
who is greater, Jesus now said unto them, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, whosoever therefore shall, shall humble himself as this little child, Peter was there, John was there, James was there, Matthew was there, those disciples were there, and he preached the same thing unto them. And he said, yes, you are disciples. Yes, you are apostles. Understand this, chapter 18 of Matthew. In chapter 10, he had sent them out two by two. And those people had gone out two by two, and they had cast out devils, and they had healed the sea. And yet he tells them, because he was impartial in his teaching, he said, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Luke chapter 13. We're looking at verse 3. Luke 13, verse 3, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. As I spoke to them at that time, he's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. Are we just in the church? We're invited. We came in. And then, as we look at how the people in the church, how they dress, how they look, how they talk, how they walk, how they bench, how they bow, and what meeting they come, so we copy them. That's not enough. That is not enough. A point must come in your life that you say, on this day, at this time, I realized I was a sinner. I realized that all the good exterior, all the polished exterior will not take me to heaven. And then you come at a definite time and you bend before the Lord. That's when you surrender your heart, your life unto the Lord and you deliberately repent of everything you remember you have done. And you bundle everything together and you say, Lord, I have done evil. I will do no more. I turn away from them. I repent of them and I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God in a definite way bears witness with your heart that you are a child of God. And your life becomes different from then. I must ask you, do you know the day? Do you know the time? Do you know the place? I can still see the place where I knelt down, where I repented, and turned away from my sin many years ago, but it's still as real as, the, as if it happened today. That must happen to you because I tell you, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And look at verse 22. In verse 22, it tells us, and he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Verse 23. In verse 23, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Enter in. When you enter through a door, it's a definite step. It's a definite experience. You know, you are outside. You decided to enter. You took action. You entered. And you entered in. 
you are outside after entering in is when you come inside the same thing with the kingdom of god you are outside the kingdom you are in sin you are in transgression you are in iniquity you took a definite step you made up your mind you decided that is the door repentance and faith in christ that leads into the kingdom and you took that step and jesus said strive to enter in at the straight gate for many i say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able to seek the lord today while you can find him look at number two number two is the invariability of christ as the teacher invariable he taught the same thing at the beginning and at the end and even when he had gone to heaven and was going to talk to the church the seven churches in asia minor he didn't change his message that same message invariable we're looking at john chapter 3 and we're reading there from verse 2 the same came to jesus by night and said unto him rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from god we know thou art a teacher come from god if a teacher comes from god and he gets his message from god god says i'm god i change not his standard does not change the scriptures do not change the message from heaven from god does not change if this teacher came from god that means his message will be the same it will not be you know changing from day to day changing from climate to climate changing from congregation to congregation changing from nation to nation it came from god look at verse 34 in verse 34 it says for he whom god has sent speaketh the words of god the lord was sent by god jesus was sent by god and because the god who sent him changes not he himself sent by god changes not he says he speaketh the words of god for god giveth not the spirit by measure unto him what that means is he gives the spirit to him without measure sent by god saturated by the spirit the word he preached remained the same uh, that's what the lord is expecting of us matthew chapter 22 reading from verse 16 in matthew 22 verse 16 for they and they sent unto him their disciples with the herodians saying master they called him master was he master yes he told his disciples he called me master and lord you say well for so am i although these were people that came to tempt him they were telling the truth when they said master we know that thou art true that's true that's what nicodemus said we know you that you are true and teaches the way of god in truth teaches the way of god in truth the way the way of god is the way of truth is the way of righteousness is the highway of holiness and it does not change if we are following after the lord we need to have that same character and that same consecration and that same commitment that the christ will follow it's not a christ that will daily daily the lord that will change with the wind and the lord that will be looking at the faces of people and then tailoring his message to their mood they said we know 
that thou teachest the way of God in truth, neither carest thou for any man. Neither carest thou for any man. That there are people that care too much about what man will do to them, what man will, you know, plan against them. And because their mind is not on God, their mind is not on the word, their mind is not on the truth, they are always thinking of what are they planning against me? What are they conspiring there against me? They're too much self-conscious. But Jesus Christ was invariable. Why could he be invariable? Because he cared for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men. That the character we ought to have, we need to become so solid in our conviction. And we need to become more stable in our character. We need to become more steadfast in the things we believe so that we're not looking at people, we're not, you know, gauging what they will do, what they will not do, how they will act. That is what makes us to be invariable, inflexible, like Christ. Look at number three here. Number three is the inflexibility of Christ even in tough times. If you have not gone through tough times in your Christian life, soon you will. If you have not been confronted by tough people, tough people, who challenge you face to face in your Christian life, soon you will. Jesus Christ, he went about doing good. The people didn't mind about the good he was doing. He healed the sick. He cleansed the lepers. He raised the dead. He cast out devils. But all those uh, Pharisees and what concerned them about those miraculous works were not concerned about that. He even opened the eyes of somebody that was born blind, and that fellow, they saw him. And he said, how did your eyes get open? He said, a man made clay. And then he put on my eyes and sent me to the pool of Siloam, and I went there, I washed, I came seen. They said, what's his name? Eventually they knew it was Jesus. They said, give glory to God that man is a sinner. And the blind man whose eyes were open said, well, I can't argue with you. Sinner, not sinner. One thing I know, God heareth not sinners. If this man why a sinner the lord would not have heard him they said are you teaching us they drove him out that man even as a young convert he had tough times he met tough people you will meet tough people and you will go through tough times the evidence that you are born again the evidence that you are saved is that in those tough times, like Jesus Christ, you remain firm, you remain clear. Here is where I stand. They talk tough. Here is where I stand. And they plan tough. Here is where I stand. That's the character of Christ. And that is the character we ought to have as children of God. The inflexibility of Christ even in tough times. In John chapter 8, reading from verse 28, then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, not that when you have exalted the Son of Man, what he meant is, I know you are going to crucify me, I know the tough time is going to come that you lift me up unto death and I will die. But when you've done that, when you've done your wars and you're lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father 
has touched me, I speak these things. Oh, may every one of us have that grace that even when the people who have the power to crucify and they have the plan to crucify, that when they are before us, what we know as the truth, the way we live for the truth, we will still live for the truth and say, eventually, maybe you pretend you don't know now, eventually you will know that I am he and I do nothing by myself, but I do everything that the Father has taught me. Verse 29, in verse 29, it says, and he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always the things that please Him. Look at verse 30. In verse 30, as they speak these words, the people saw the sincerity, the transparency in what He said, and they, they saw through Him His personality. He was not a person, a chameleon, that you'll be here like this and there at another time. When you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. And when you are, you know, in another place, Babylon, do as the Babylonians did know. He came from heaven and he showed the life of heaven. He was impartial. He was invariable. He was inflexible. And because people saw through and they saw that transparency, they saw that honesty, and they saw that here is no pretense at all. Many believed on him. I pray you will live a life that is believable. I said you will live a life that is believable. Uh, what a wonderful thing it will be if uh, your converted wife will see your life. That, you know, what you know in the Bible, uh, you practice it at home. And because of that, the woman says, I'm going to believe. What a wonderful thing if your husband will see the life of Christ in you. Honest, honest, and devoted, and steadfast, transparent before the Lord and your husband will say the life of this woman convinces me that this thing they call salvation is true and because of that they believe in you. What a wonderful thing if the teenagers you're teaching at school they'll say the life of her teacher, the life of her mistress because of her life we're going to believe in the Lord, in Hebrews chapter 13, we're looking at verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. Any of the disciples could have said that before this was reaching, that yesterday, when he went about doing good, and today as they arrest him, today as Judas betrayed him, today as they're going to hand him over to Pilate, he's still the same as he was yesterday. So he is today. And Peter thrust, took out the sword and cut off the ear of Malchus. And today, as that, as Peter did that in defending him, he stood down, took the ear and put it back. The same yesterday, today, and forever. In the day of trial, no anger. In the day of uh, temptation, pressure, no anger. And there's no fighting. Uh, thank you, Peter that you did that, you know, you should, you should not only cut off the ear, cut off another part. No, no, no. Because Jesus Christ, yesterday, when there was no problem, he was good. Today, when there is problem, he's good. And then after he died, he rose again. And by the time he rose, the people were Peter, 
they had gone a fishing and he went there but all the same yesterday today and tomorrow and forever the same children have ye any bread no anger no fighting no kind of conflict that's the way the lord wants us to be he will give us grace he'll give you more grace that in your tough times you'll be like jesus look at verse 9 in verse 9 be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines be as stable as christ for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein the same the same the same all the time let's come to point number two now number two the royal law of love for the royal priesthood we're looking at james chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 8 if he fulfill the royal law now the royal law as you think about the law coming from the old testament there is the ceremonial law the ceremonial law is you know concerning killing of animals and shedding the blood the ceremonial law is concerning if you touch a dead body then you're unclean till the evening if uh, you touch a pot or whatever then that thing is unclean then the leper has to also cover his more unclean unclean ceremonial law that's different there is the civil law the civil law is you know what guides people in society that uh, you know the the speed limit as you drive on the road and when you take care when you are going to build you have to have a permit for the construction the civil law but there is the moral law moral law many people do not they just say the law the law the law and they say the law is abolished ceremonial law abolished the law that controls all those altar sacrifices of the old testament abolished because christ has become the final sacrifice for all our sins but the royal law the moral law the law of love loving your neighbor as yourself that one has not been abolished and loving the lord with all your heart all your soul all your mind that one can never be abolished actually when we get to heaven you see need to love the lord when you get to heaven so the law of love can never be abolished and then when you get to heaven you still love all the inhabitants of heaven love will be the great thing the central thing in heaven you know why god is love and in heaven everything will be built around love so don't say the law is abolished if you don't understand the law of love abides and remains the royal law of love for the royal priesthood it says in that james chapter 2 verse 8 if he fulfill the royal law according to the scripture thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself ye do well look at verse 9 in verse 9 but if he have respect to persons he commits sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors now look at first peter chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 9 first peter chapter 2 verse 9 but ye are not were ye are at this present time a chosen generation a royal priesthood 
an holy nation, a peculiar people that she should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have the royal priesthood and we have the royal law, the law of love by which we live, by which we think, by which we plan, because it's what we think in the heart that shows forth in our practical outward expression of living. The royal law has to be in the heart. The royal law has to be in our thoughts. The royal law has to be in our imagination, in our planning, and then it comes out in our practical life. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, practicing the royal law without discrimination. Number two, performing the royal law without defilement. Number three, proclaiming the royal law without deviation. Number one. Number one is practicing the royal law without discrimination. It tells us, let's come back to James chapter 2 verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law, if ye fulfill the royal law, you are driving on the way. And there are other drivers, motorists also driving. Fulfill the royal law. Don't just think about yourself. I have the right of way. And then eventually you cause accident. Live by the royal law. In your place of work, the way you relate with your director, the manager, and the way you relate with the junior, with the, uh, with the uh, lower people in the cadre, the royal law. If I'm in his position, how would I want him to relate with me? If I were in her position, how would I want her to talk to me? The royal law. And when you meet your friends, you're not trying to defraud them or do anything. If I were the person having that company, having that money, having those employees, how would I want my employees to deal with me? The royal law. And when you're dealing with the employee, the, the employees too, as an employer, how do I deal with them? How do I pay them? the deal and how do I recognize their need and meet their need the royal law and in your family husband and wife the royal law parents and children the royal law and to your in-laws the royal law and it depends on how you think when you think right you will act right when you think right you behave right when you think right and you're not thinking of myself myself what do i have what do i gain and what am i happy about when you're thinking of the other people others first others first when you think about their joy you think about their happiness you think about their gladness and you think about what cheers them up others first then you'll be living by the royal law. You're practicing the royal law without discrimination. It tells us in, um, in Matthew chapter 25, reading from verse 34. Matthew chapter 25 verse 34. Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world verse 35 in verse 35 for when i was an hungered ye give me meat let me ask you if the hungry person that you have seen if he were Christ, real Christ, and he just appeared to you and is hungry, what will you do? If that person 
that you are relating with was real, real Christ, what will you do? How will you behave if uh, your fellow brother, your fellow sister, if it happened that he was real Christ? You've been saying, if I were on earth, when Christ was alive here on earth, this is the way I will live. What if that brother, that sister, if he were Christ, how will you behave? How will you treat him? How will you relate with her? Look at this. For I was an ungodge, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. If that person who was sick, or who is sick, around you there, your neighbor there, also a brother, also a child of God, if that person uh, is sick, if that were Christ himself, are you going to wait for the instruction of a zonal leader, of a coordinator, go and visit so and so? No, you will not wait. You will be so eager. You go and visit him. And Jesus said, I was sick, and he visited me. I was in prison. And ye came unto me. Lord, I would have gone, but I'm not in the prison ministry. I'm not among those people who have been selected to go to the prison. But you know that person is in the prison, lonely there. If it were Christ, do you need to belong to a prison ministry? Before you do something, look at verse 37. In verse 37, then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, we saw we thee and hungered, and, and, uh, and thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink. Verse 38, when saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, uh, or naked, and clothed thee. Verse 39. Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee. Verse 40 now. In verse 40, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, in as much as she have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Amen. Amen. May the Lord open our eyes to understand what the Lord is going to reward on the final day. People think the best thing you can do, stay at the pulpit and preach. And after that, they do nothing else. No helping hand, no comforting word, no nothing to support other people. I'm a preacher, I'm a preacher. And that's enough. And after preaching, 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 what else should I do? Look at what you do to feed the hungry and to give water to the thirsty and to clothe the naked not to be so busy that you cannot touch the people that need encouragement and Jesus said you did to the least of my brethren you have done it unto me look at verse 41 in verse 41 then shall he say also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire 
prepared for the devil and his angels. And if you read further, those people are going to ask why. Because I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. Lord, if we saw you in that condition, we will minister to you. And because you didn't do it to the least of these, my brethren, you have not done it unto me. Our salvation must bear fruit, the fruit of kindness. And the fruit of practical love, practicing the royal law without discrimination. Look at number two here. Number two, performing the royal law without defilement. Without defilement. We're looking at James chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. The scripture is balanced, very much balanced. That we're fulfilling the royal law does not mean that we're going to disobey the word of God. It is like a frame, it's like a cake, not turned over, burnt on one side and raw and defiled on the other side. Balance up everything. We fulfill the royal law. We love people, but we don't allow lust to come into that law. I'm visiting a, you know, a sick sister, a sick brother, and then while visiting, I take food, I take, you know, whatever necessary items, but right there is like Amnon and Tamar. Seek, come and give a food, and while giving the food, Amnon then refundled her and messed her up. In giving food, in giving money, in taking care of people, we fulfill the royal law of love without allowing any form of lust, any form of immorality, any form of the works of the flesh. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, for he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. In obeying one part of scripture, we do not disregard or disobey or deny the other part of scripture. We're looking at Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, reading from verse 8. O no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law, the royal law. Verse 9. In verse 9, for this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, moral law, not ceremonial law, moral law. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Can we say that together? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Say it by yourself. Your neighbor starts with your wife. Love your wife 
as yourself. Your neighbor starts with your husband. Love your husband as yourself. Your neighbor starts with all those people you're living with at home. Charity begins at home. Love those people as yourself. Your neighbor starts with the people who are physically near to you. Think in love, plan in love, operate in love. Let everything you do be of love. Not that, you know, we just have it in the head and then it's not in the heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Well, coming to number three here. Number three, proclaiming the royal law without deviation. Proclaiming, teaching it, explaining it, expounding it, applying it. We preach to ourselves first, we proclaim to ourselves first that fellow is a false preacher, false prophet who preaches to other people and he doesn't preach that same word to himself. And that's how you discover false prophets. They can declare, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. They preach it to others, they don't preach to themselves. It's like the husband quoting the Bible to his wife. And that same verse of scripture, he never quotes to himself. It's like the wife always bugging the husband with Bible, Bible, Bible verses. And the wife quoting the scripture to the husband and never quotes the scripture to herself. It's like, you know, the little child, they're having family devotion and the parents gave opportunity uh, to, you know, for that boy to be the one that will read the Bible and preach to us this morning. And that boy takes the opportunity of being wanting to say something and preaching to the parents and not preaching to himself. When we proclaim the royal law, we proclaim that royal law first to ourselves. And now we also proclaim it to other people. Proclaiming the royal law without deviation. Deviation without division. You know, there are times uh, if you preach of the word of God, maybe you see something in the Bible and um, if I say it the way I should say it, my husband will say, look at that. My wife will say, look at that. So you know that that's in the scripture and you, are preach and you interpret it well. Well, when we get home, I'm going to ask him a question about that. And there are people, they will deviate from the proper interpretation and from the proper application of the word because if I read that, if I say that, that thing will boomerang. It will come back to me. Deviation, don't deviate. The word of God is higher than any man. The word of God is greater than any man. It's much, much older than any man. If he fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. Look at the first part of verse 12. In verse 12, so speak ye, and so do. So speak ye. Proclaim it forcefully. Proclaim it faithfully. Proclaim it transparently. And let the word of God remain the word of God. Even if you have to go and pray and say, those who have heard you might be wondering, uh-huh, you're preaching, but look at this, but look at that. Let the word of God be preached and proclaimed without deviation. In Matthew chapter 22, 
We're reading from verse 37. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy all thy soul and with all thy mind look at verse 38 in verse 38 this is the first and the great commandment what's the first sin and the great sin the inability to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind if that loving the Lord with all your heart is the first commandment the first sin is disobeying that transgressing that if that is the great command commandment that you love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul all your mind the great sin is that you are not doing that and when the Lord commands you and he said this is what to do this is the direction to go and it is the, what to live for if you don't do that you don't love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul all your mind and you are committing the first sin and the greatest sin look at verse 39 in verse 39 and the second is like unto it Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love thy wife, thy husband as thyself. Thou shalt love thy parent, thy child as thyself. Thou shalt love that member, that friend as thyself. Look at verse 40. In verse 40, on these two commandments, loving God, loving man, loving God with all your heart, loving man as yourself, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What does that mean? When you read the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you determine the law. On this loving God is the interpretation of whatever you find there. And then the prophets, when you read what the prophets are preaching, and you, the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, and Amos, and all of them, the interpretation. You must not interpret anything in those books of the law and the prophets contrary to this royal law. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Mark chapter 12. We're looking at verse 29. In Mark chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is here. O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Verse 30, in verse 30, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. All thy strength. If you have little strength, expend it. Serve the Lord with that strength. If you have greater strength serve the Lord with all your strength pastor I'm weak today you're weak but you can stand you're weak but you can walk you're weak and you can go to the bathroom you're weak and you can eat the strength that remains in that weakness all the strength you have lived serve the Lord and love the Lord with all thy strength this is the first commandment look at verse 31 in verse 31 and the second is like is like uh, namely this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself there is no none other commandment greater than these all those ceremonial commandments 
the Old Testament, none can compare with this. There's none other commandment greater than this. Verse 32. In verse 32, and the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. Verse 33. In verse 33, and to love him with all thine heart and with all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole bunch offerings and sacrifices. Look at that. All the sacrifices you read about in the Old Testament, all the bond offerings you read about in the Old Testament, there is nothing comparable to loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And the man confirmed that. Look at verse 34. And, and it says, When Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. He wasn't in yet, but he wasn't far. Just because he knew that in the head doesn't mean he got to the kingdom of God. Just because he agreed with what Jesus has said, that doesn't mean he had entered. There are many people that will affirm. There are many people that will give accent to the word of God. Well, until you repent, until you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, until that word becomes part of your life, part of your character and part of your motivation everything you do you have not entered in yet and jesus said thou art not far from the kingdom of god we're coming to point number three now point number three we're looking at the renewed law of liberty for all regenerated people the renewed law that the law that is still there now and is renewed from generation to generation is renewed for everyone in the kingdom this is not the old ceremonial law here is the very law of God for everyone in James chapter 2 reading from verse 12 in James chapter 2 verse 12 so speak ye and so do. So speak ye, and so do. Preacher, so speak ye, and so do. Leaders in the church, so speak ye. Preach sound doctrine. Don't stop at preaching. Don't stop at proclamation. So speak ye, and so do. Leaders in the house fellowship, and leaders among men, Leaders among women, those who teach on marriage, and those who teach on the family, and those who encourage and counsel other people, sectional leaders, so speak ye. Don't say anything contrary to love in trying to kind of promote your position and your section. So speak ye. Only by the word of love. Don't speak anything contrary to love, loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. So speak ye, every member of the church, so speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Verse 13, in verse 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. Mercy, love, tenderness, gentleness. Yes, affirm the truth in love. 
Present the truth with mercy. Hold sound doctrine with love, with tenderness, because for he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. We're looking at three things here. Number one, the mirror of the perfect law of liberty. Number two, the ministry of the probing law of the Lord. Number three, the might of the powerful law of life. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the mirror of the perfect law of liberty. In James uh, chapter 1, we're reading from verse 23. James chapter 1, verse 23. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, that is, in a mirror. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, it says, For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgeteth what manner of man he was. Forgeteth what manner of man he was. Whenever we come to the Bible study, we're shown the mirror of the Word of God. And when the mirror is upheld before us, we see our spiritual face. We see our spiritual life. We see all the things we wouldn't have known about our personal life, about our private life, and about the things that need to be corrected. We look at the mirror. If after looking at the mirror, at a time of prayer, we don't have, we don't give the time to pray. The time is there. Uh, the person leading the prayer is leading the prayer, but we're not praying. We're not praying on what we saw in the mirror of the watch of God. We'll be like people who don't have any mirror. I read of a man who was um, a prisoner of war, P-O-W, and he was captured. And they incarcerated him and put him in a kind of room, but there was no mirror in that room. Deliberately, they did that. So that for one year, for two years, for three years, would you believe he spent 50 years in that prison as a prisoner of war? And all those 50 years, no mirror. He wasn't allowed to look at any mirror. And think of a person, if he entered there at the age of 25 and came out at the age of 75, and the first thing he wanted to see was he wanted a mirror after 50 years of being inside that place. And when he got a mirror and looked at his face, he dropped the mirror and started crying profusely because he, could, he had not seen that face for 50 years. And, uh, you know, that, that's like people who maybe they carry the Bible, but they never read the Bible to show themselves their face, how they look before God, how they look, and they're going to eternity. Of all these many years, maybe they hear the word of God, but uh, every time they hear, they forget who they were. After 10 years of coming like that, coming like that, when one day you see your real self, you break down because you didn't know that this is how you are. That's the reason why every time you hear the word of God, look at that mirror and see what mirror, what that mirror is saying about you. And then go to the fountain of the blood of the Lamb and be washed and be cleansed so that the mirror revealing something to you will lead you to the fountain of the blood of the Lamb that cleanses your life because he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgeteth what manner of man he was. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, 
but also looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continuous therein he be not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work this man shall be blessed in his deed you'll be blessed i will be blessed the lord help you to make use of the privilege of hearing the word and being cleansed in the blood of them. Look at, look at number two. Number two, in the ministry of the probing law of the Lord. We're looking at Acts chapter 24, reading from verse 24. Acts 24, reading from verse 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. What's faith in Christ? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Beyond that, repentance, understanding your inability to save yourself. And because of that, you're introduced to the only one that can save, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you are called upon, believe after you have repented. And so he sent for Paul the apostle concerning faith in Christ. Here is now the ministry of the word, verse 25. In verse 25, and as he reasoned of righteousness, Temperance, the self control, and judgment to come. Felix trembled. The law of God probed him, searched him, and looked at everything in his life. The law of God spoke about the righteousness of God, the righteousness expected by God, and looked at his own righteousness and his righteousness way far beyond behind the righteousness expected by God and spoke about temperance temperance the control that begins in the spirit control is not just controlling your tongue your heart has to be under control before you can control the tongue your spirit has to be under control before you can control your external life and when he spoke about the implication of self-control spirit control life control and the control of the scripture on a person's life and he spoke of judgment to come and he put him on the balances with his wife Drusilla and put them on the balances and they were found wanting he trembled that what a probing of the word of God does but trembling is not enough Felix what are you going to do after that will you repent Felix, what are you going to do after that? Will you make restitution? Felix, what are you going to do after that? Will you come to the fountain of the blood of the Lamb and be cleansed and be washed and be saved? It says, Felix said, he answered, Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I will come I will call for thee. He never called. The people who hear, they don't take action. And they say, next day, next time, I come to the next Bible study. I come to the next meeting. That's how they postpone, postpone their salvation, their repentance, their coming back to the Lord, their restoration. Such people, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. They never come and if they die before that tomorrow comes they perish well we're looking at number three here number three we're looking at the might of the powerful law of life the word of god is mighty and the word of god does something within us that no other instrument can do in romans chapter 8 
We're reading from verse 2. Romans chapter 8. We're reading here from verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is so mighty, is so powerful as you present yourself before that mighty word of God, powerful word of God, and you're allowed to do a redemptive work in your heart. And you're allowed to do a reviving work in your heart. You're allowed to do a regenerating work in your heart. You will never be the same again. I will never be the same again. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. It will make you free. Tonight, free from all the things that tied you when you were powerless and helpless. Free. And all the things that, you know, became like a habit. And that's how you have been, how you have been. And you have been wondering, how can I get out of this? The Lord sets you free tonight. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh the Lord will condemn every sin in your nature in Jesus name and he will root it out you lost an amen. amen. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says that the righteousness of the Lord may be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightier than ever before in Jesus' name. It will dwell in your heart. You will lead and control your life. And everything that you found impossible before, the Spirit of the Lord will make it possible to live a transparently righteous life, even from tonight in Jesus' name. I invite you to the Lord to tell the Lord what your need is. And I invite you to tell the Lord that His mighty Spirit and His powerful Spirit will walk in your heart more than ever before in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. He's able to help. He's willing to help. He will help you. Cry mightily unto the Lord. And don't hide anything. Reveal where you are, who you are, how you are unto the Lord. And the Lord will do the incredible, the impossible in your life. It'll make you ready, ready for heaven. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.